Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly. We are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for the people of God. If you loved me, you would just kind of fill in the blank there. Or if you really loved me, you would fill in the blank. Have you ever used those words? Don't raise your hand, okay? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. (laughs) Have you ever heard those words coming back to you from someone? Yeah. I've always thought a kind of a mature response to that would be, You know, if you really love me, you wouldn't use my feelings for you to try to manipulate me to get what you want. A warning with that response, however, it may generate hot debate for a few minutes, okay? But the reality is this. Nobody likes to be manipulated. We don't like the idea of being manipulated. We don't especially like the idea of our feelings for people being used as a tool to generate and to be manipulated. And yet, you know what? It's kind of a common problem, isn't it? A lot of us deal with that in one way or another in our walks of life. We deal with it in the relationships that we have at all different levels. And I think in the reality is, many of us deal with that in one way or another in our relationship with God, this idea of, manipulation. Today's text continues in this series of sermons talking about the final words of Jesus and really the words that are a part of the crucifixion scene, words which Jesus said while hanging on the cross and dying. And today's reading is the reading about the two thieves. If you remember the story, Jesus was crucified between two thieves, one on the left and one on the right. That was done intentionally to uh, increase the humiliation, to place Jesus in the category of those who were being uh, crucified with him, those who were common criminals. He was being marked as a common criminal like the others who were there on that scene. Two of the Gospels, interesting enough, basically say, Mark and Matthew, that Both of the thieves reviled Jesus. Both of the thieves mocked him. Both of the thieves uh, had nothing good to say toward him or about him. But Luke tells us a different version and a different story. Luke is the one who gives us the story with this interaction in it today about the two thieves and the very different way in which they related to Jesus. And what I find interesting in this is that the way these two thieves related to Jesus is still enormously common in our world today and is largely the way I think people relate, one way or the other, in relationship to God and relationship to Christ. If we look at the responses of the first thief, what does he say? His opening line is, aren't you the Messiah? The thief begins with a question, doesn't he? He's asking the question. He's not professing something. He's not stating a fact. He's not stating a belief, but he's asking a question. Aren't you the Messiah? And then the line following that is, and if you are, then this is what you need to do to prove that to me. And what does he want? Well, of course, what he wants is for Jesus to free himself and to free him as well in response to that. And so 
it almost as if the thief on the cross is saying, if you really loved me, as you say you do, this is what you would do for me. In case you're not aware of it, God doesn't enjoy our manipulation any more than you or I enjoy the manipulation as well. And what you really get at this is an understanding of how some people understand God and how people view God and how people want their relationship with God to be. And that is that if I'm to have a relationship with God, then what I really need from God is this. I really need for God to take care of me. And by taking care of me, that means when I get in trouble, God gets me out. When I do bad things, God makes it better. It's really, God, you are the one who gets me out of the consequences for the things that I do and the things that I say. So that when I get in a really tight spot in life, God, that's when you're supposed to do something. That's when you're supposed to act so that bad things don't happen to me in response to that. And that's the kind of God I want. And so what I'm always asking is, hey, if you're really God and you really love me, then you'll get me out of this. You will keep me from having to have this experience. You will get rid of these consequences which are a part of my life. And that's exactly where thief number one is. Salvation in this situation means I don't have to go through bad things. I don't have to deal with negative consequences. Salvation means you're getting me out of trouble. Now, there's a long history of that in the Bible. You go back and you start reading the Old Testament, and you'll see this comes up over and over and over again. What do the people want from God? Well, we want you to rescue us out of this situation we've got ourselves into. And so, in some ways, thief number one is expressing a theology which he's probably known and heard before in relationship to that. The problem in so many ways is simply this. Trying to live in relationship with God that way doesn't work because you're always telling God what it means to be God. You're always saying to God, now if you're really God, this is what you'll do. If you're really God, this is who you'll be. If you're really God, this is how you'll act. And God doesn't live that way. God doesn't deal that way. God doesn't live in relationship with you and me that way. God will not live in relationship with us, telling us all the time what it means for you to be God. But that is a response to God. And we hear it and see it in our world all the time. If there was a loving God, these things wouldn't happen. If God really cared about people, this wouldn't be like this. And what we're really doing in that level is simply saying, not just we don't understand, but we're saying, that's not how God should act. And we're telling God how God should act. Let's take a moment and contrast that with the response of the second thief in accordance with the Gospel of Luke. He begins by asking a question, but really in the question making a profession. And he says, do you not fear God? He says that to the first thief, do you not fear God? And what he's saying in that is, do you not fear God? Because I fear God. Now, obviously, the guy's not crystal clean because he's hanging on a cross dying for being a thief. And... He goes on to say, you know what? I'm getting what I deserve. Now, I would have an issue with that because I honestly don't think anybody deserves to be crucified on a cross, and I don't really care what you've done. But in his day and in his time, in that situation, that's what he's saying. He's saying, I fear God, and I'm getting what I deserve. And in that statement... What he's doing is making a confession, isn't he? He's saying, you know what? I've done things in my life that are wrong, and I'm owning that. I'm admitting to that. 
I'm not blaming the people who caught me. I'm not blaming the people who raised me. I'm not blaming the crowd that I ran with. I'm just saying I did what's wrong, and I'm getting what I deserved. This is my sin, and I'm confessing it. And so he makes that statement. He confesses that. And then he goes on to say two really incredible things. Remember me when you get into your kingdom. In the statement, looking at the back part first, when he tells Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, what is he saying in that statement? He is saying in that statement, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you have a kingdom, and I believe you're going to that kingdom. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And what does he ask for? Which is incredible. He simply says, remember me. He doesn't ask to be forgiven. He doesn't ask to be rescued. He asks for a relationship. Just don't forget me. Remember me. Remember me. And of course, what's the response of Jesus in this situation? You bet. I'm going to remember you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. When we contrast the two thieves, what's interesting is the second thief and his response follows a pattern that's going to be in the New Testament that is a little bit before that, but will be in it over and over again. And we see it in several different places. In 1 John 1, if, you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Jesus said this earlier in the Gospel of John when he's speaking to Martha. If you remember the scene of Jesus and Martha having their interaction at the death of Lazarus before he's raised from the dead, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The thief, without ever knowing it, without ever having somebody come and walk them through those steps, is making a profession of faith that leads to salvation. Following the steps that the New Testament would follow for years and decades and still follows today, matter of fact. He professes who Jesus is, he confesses his sins, and he asks for a relationship. And Jesus says, you bet, you're in. Today, you will walk with me in paradise. I think these two thieves continue to offer to us the reflection on the way we relate to God in the world in which we live, and the tension that we find in the middle of that. The more we try to tell God who God is and what God should do, the harder our relationship with God, the more challenging our relationship with God, the more distant our relationship with God, the more God resists our attempts to manipulate God's love for each and every one of us. But when we, like the thief, are ready to say, you know what, you're God and I'm not. You know the brokenness in my life, you know the sin that lives in me. I confess that to you. And I want to be in relationship with you. And when we're willing to lay no more on it than that, 
then I think we have the same response toward us that the thief has from Christ who says, absolutely, I do remember you and I do know you. And you walk with me today and every day. These two thieves on the cross illustrate to us how to and not to live and walk with God. And if the relationship that you have with God today is not as deep and as rich and as full as you would like for it to be, I invite you to think about that. And I invite you to, t to pray about that. And I invite you to ask yourself one simple question. How much of that is because I want to tell God how to be God rather than I want God to tell me who God is and to live in response to that? Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, it had to be a pretty amazing scene, God. And maybe nobody gathering around those crosses got it. Maybe none of them saw it. Maybe none of them realized it. That how the world would respond to you started right there with those two individuals one demanding something from you and the other just asking to be loved. Help us, God, to find our way clear in our own hearts and in our own lives to own who we are and day after day simply ask to be loved, to be remembered, to be allowed to be with you. In your name we pray. Amen.